Twenty years ago today, 1976, was the first time I preached in Faith Tabernacle Assembly, and the message title was, We Have Not Yet Arrived. And I, at that time, I spoke about the children of Israel going out of Egyptian bondage, going into the Promised Land. Today, I'm using the same title, but not the same content by any means, I'm glad to tell you that we're still on our journey. We haven't arrived as yet. Now, at the time the church started 20 years ago, there were those individuals who felt like that faith tabernacle was the ultimate answer. It wasn't. It still is not the ultimate answer, but I'm glad we are representing the ultimate answer. His name is Jesus. Glory to God. Since that time, there have been those who started out with us who have quit. They dropped by the wayside. Some have become disenchanted. Some have accepted other ideologies. And a lot of changes has come about down through these 20 years. But I'm glad that I can stand tall this morning and lift my hand as high as I can and say the church of Jesus Christ is marching on. Glory to God, the church of Jesus Christ is continuing to go forward. And dear friends, since it is going forward, and if we claim to be part of that church, and I'm not talking about the Faith Tabernacle Assembly, I'm talking about the, the church, the individual. Since the church of Jesus Christ is marching forward, and if we say we're part of that church, it becomes very obvious we haven't arrived yet. We're still in the journey. We're still marching forward. And I trust that you have that marching attitude in your heart today. We're going to heaven. A number of years ago, when our children were quite small, one of the little boys run in the house one day, and I was getting ready to go somewhere. And he said, where are you going, Dad? I said, I'm going to heaven. So he takes off outside and starts running up and down the street telling all his friends that Daddy is going to heaven. Well, I'd much rather he had that story to tell than just the opposite. But we're still on our journey. We haven't yet arrived. There's many verses of Scripture that I would love to read this morning. And if you do not mind, I'll read fast from the book of Philippians, chapter number 3, and beginning with verse number 7. As I said, there's quite a number here that I do want to read, but I feel like that every one of them says so much that I want you to remember. Beginning verse 7, chapter 3, the book of Philippians, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, 
the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as you have heard us for an, ex an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And I want you to notice briefly verse number 22, and then some other things here that I want to call to your attention. But verse number 22 says, Who shall change this vile body? Now, I believe that's all the way of saying that you and I have not yet arrived, because we are anticipating that great and grand and glorious change when this mortal shall put on immortality, when this corruptible shall take on incorruption. And this indeed is going to be a great change. And my friend, there is only one that can make that change, and that is the Lord himself. Amen. There is no way that we can pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps. There's no way that we can make a redeemed child of God within our own efforts and energy. But thank God the Lord can. I like the words of a song that we used to hear quite frequently. Who made the stars? Who made the moon? Who made the sun? Nobody but my Lord. Who made the human race? Who put it all in place? Nobody but my Lord. And friends, this change that is going to take place in our lives is not going to be because we are a member of Faith Tabernacle Assembly of God, but it's because we have placed our hand in the nail-scarred hand of the Lord Jesus. Thank God, and He Himself is going to bring about that great change that is going to lift us up above the shadows of and plant our feet on higher ground. <laughs> Glory to God. There is a change in the offering for the children of God. And I like what Paul tells us in, in another scripture that I read here in Philippians. He said, I press toward the mark. Glory to God. When I read this the other day, the statement stood out in my mind and seemed like the Lord just illuminated it. The mark. Dear friend, we are not shadow boxing today. We are not just beating the air, but we know that there is a mark in view. We know that there is a goal in view, and we are pressing toward the mark. It is not just any old mark, but it is the mark. Glory to God. Many, many folk in their younger years especially look forward with great anticipation, and there's nothing wrong with this as long as it is kept in perspective. But they're looking forward to that time when they can gain a companion for their life. Many look forward to recognition, and there's nothing wrong with that, again, as long as it is kept in proper perspective. Many want position, power, and prestige, but my friend, regardless of what might transpire in this world, Let's don't get our eye off the goal that is ahead. Amen. And this writer said that I press 
toward the mark. I'm going to be disillusioned and I'll be disappointed with a lot of things that's going to happen to me in this life. But, Sister Day, there is no disappointment in Jesus. I believe that when we stand before the great judge of the universe and we hear the Master say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I believe that it's going to erase all the toils of this life and we're going to thank God a thousand times over that we never quit along the journey. But we continued. We haven't arrived yet, but we're still pressing toward that mark. Glory to God, the mark, the mark of heaven, the mark of the rapture of the church, the mark, hallelujah. And this should be our ultimate goal, heaven. The rapture of the church. I know that we have plans for things all throughout life. Again, there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's kept in perspective. But friends, let's don't ever lose sight of the goal that is yet ahead. Amen. Jesus is coming. Thank God. And he's coming for those who are looking for him. You say we're going to heaven. That's exactly right. I'm glad that I can still tell my boys uh, after some probably 25 or 30 years, uh, son, your dad is still on his way to heaven. Amen. I haven't turned around. I haven't changed my mind. Uh, I'm still planning to go to heaven. You say, well, where is heaven? I don't mean to sound too simplistic when I give you this rendering of where heaven is, uh, but I want you just to consider with me that heaven is is where the Lord is. Amen. I know there's been a lot of books written and there's been a lot of messages preached about heaven and what's in store and it's all well and good. But again, friend, I say that heaven is where the Lord is. That's why we can sing that old, old song, Anywhere is home if Christ my Lord is there. And I believe we could turn, the, turn that over on the flip side and say that you will never feel at home if you are not in the presence of God. And to many individuals who have chosen in the past many years to go their separate direction, I believe that the vast majority of them, if they would be honest with themselves, they would have to concede, I never feel comfortable. I never feel at home simply because I cannot feel the presence of the Most High God. Glory to God. It is the Lord, hallelujah, that makes us feel at home. Again, I want to say that heaven is indeed going to be heaven because that's where the Lord is. We all have had a wonderful experience of going into a friend's home who dearly loved the Lord. And when you walk through those doors, you could sense in the very atmosphere the heavenly presence was there because that individual loved God supremely and they prayed and talked to the Lord and every morning invited the presence of God to dwell in that home today. Dear friends, there are many people today who are lost and undone. I heard the story one time of a man who was not serving God. He was as lost as he could be, and his wife was such a kind, loving lady, and she did everything in her power to make her husband feel comfortable in the house. She was a godly woman. She loved God supremely, and she also loved her husband. The husband made life very miserable for her. And someone asked her one day, says, how is it that you can be so kind and gentle to your husband, seeing that he treats you like he does? She said, I love my husband, and I know that if he does not get right with God, the only heaven that he will ever know is what he experiences right here in this house. Amen. God help us to maintain this heavenly atmosphere around us. Jesus said on one occasion, and was quoted in Sunday school, I go to prepare a place for you. The Word also says, Come unto me. The Word further says, In that day when I make up my jewels, 
they shall be mine. And throughout the Word of God, you can find reference after reference that would indicate the fact that the Lord himself is going to draw unto himself where he is his family. Glory to God. Be where the Lord is. That's where heaven is going to be. Amen. The real question today is, are we really ready to go to heaven? Now, I know that that may seem like a redundant question to ask such an enlightened and intelligent and a spiritual congregation such as you are today. But, dear friends, one of the most important questions, in fact, it is an all-important question, am I ready to go to heaven? I confess to you that every morning I want to look myself, I want to look at myself, in the mirror of the Word of God, and I want to seek the face of the Lord, and I ask myself the question again and again and again, by examining myself, do I have what it takes to go to heaven? You may say that I'm a weakling, you can say whatever you want to, but I want to start out every day knowing that all is right between my soul and the Savior. Amen. So it's important that we ask ourselves the question, Am I really ready to go to heaven? And I make this statement, and I want to emphasize it much this morning, because I've had members of this congregation through the years who have said to me in one way or another, I hope that everything is all right. I plan to go to heaven, and they've always left somewhat of a little doubt in their statement as to whether or not they really knew it. My friend, you may not know what the stock market is going to do. You may not know what the politicians are going to do. You may not know what the church world is going to do, but you had better know where you're going. Amen. You'd better know that your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I am not doubting anyone's testimony this morning who said that they're going to heaven, and I'm certainly not trying to put anyone on a guilt trip, but I do pray this morning that every one of us will look at our experience again. Am I really ready to go to heaven? That makes all the difference in the world. It sure does. The enemy's number one objective in this world is to keep you out of heaven. Amen? That's his number one objective, keep you out of heaven. The devil does not care how often you go to church. He doesn't care how much you give in the offering. He doesn't care how often you testify and sing. Don't misunderstand me this morning. These things are great. And it's, it's automatic to a person that's in touch with God. But friends, there's got to be more than just going to church. I've heard a lot of parents make the statement. And some of these parents I knew well. And I've heard them make the statement that I can't understand why my child turned out like they did because I brought them up in church. That's commendable. But friends, if there's not an altar at home, the altar in the church is not going to make a whole lot of difference. Don't get too quiet on me now. Amen. If there's not some teaching of the Word of God at home, don't leave it up to the Sunday school teacher to get across to that student all that they're going to need to live a victorious Christian life. Amen? If there are bad reports given continually in the home concerning the conduct of people in the church, what makes you think that child is going to grow up with any respect for God or the leadership of the church? Amen? The devil has done much in the last many, many years. In fact, he started out with this of uh, uh, deceiving a lot of folk. But the Bible tells us that everyone that knocks on the door of heaven is not going to get in. Everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is not going to make it. But it's he that doeth the will of the Father. 
Glory to God. We're on our way today, friend. We haven't arrived. And yes, it is important that we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. The devil is still using his great tool of deception against the many. And I know folk, and you do too, who will testify and tell you very quickly, I'm ready to go. And then in the next breath, they'll say, I'm going to stop by the beer joint on the way home tonight and have a drink. Those things are not compatible. We're not judging the individuals. But my friend, the Bible says that by their fruits you will know them. But the devil has sold them a bill of goods. There's too many folk with this philosophy. It doesn't make any difference what I do because I'm a member of a church. Therefore, I'm going to heaven. They are being deceived. Many think that they have time to get right with God and to make their calling and election sure. They have the attitude that in some future date I'm going to repent and I'm going to make things right. May God have mercy upon their soul and give them another opportunity. But dear friends, none of us has any promise of tomorrow. We can't put it off until tomorrow hoping that things will be better. Amen. Yes, as I've already indicated, there's many folk who will say, I hope everything will be all right. I trust that it will too, but friends, we've got to have more than just that kind of experience. Since we have not arrived yet, we're still on our journey, hallelujah. I believe that it becomes very obvious that we are continuing that way of life. And now the main question becomes... Am I on the right road? Am I on the right road? The Bible tells us that there are many ways unto man. Man has devised and concocted thousands of ways, saying this is the way, walk ye in it. But dear friends, we'd better make sure that the road we're on is the right road. Glory to God, which is the right road? I find in the book of Second Peter, I believe it is, time and time again, he speaks about a way. And in one place, he speaks about the way of truth. He speaks about the way of righteousness. He speaks about the way of remembrance. And he also speaks about the right way. And many of the other gospel writers... They will make statements such as the way of salvation, the way of the Lord. And thank God they also say the way of our God. This points out to what Jesus said in John 14. (coughs) He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Glory to God. Thank God there is a way of salvation. There is a way of righteousness, and only those who are walking in that way are going to be those that will ultimately arrive at their desired destination, and that's heaven. Amen? It is not the way of the assemblies of God. It is not the way of any other church denomination or movement, but it is the way of the Lord. Amen. The Bible tells us that the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk therein. I believe that's all the way of saying that man's way will lead you down into destruction and will ultimately prove to be wrong. But the ways of the Lord are right. Glory to God. I like that. I said the ways of the Lord are right. We all know the difference in right and wrong. And when the Lord said his way is right, that means we'd better bring our ways submissive and subjective to the ways of the Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Glory to God. Now, if we are indeed on the right road, and I trust that everyone is this morning, I believe that we need to do two things in particular that Paul points out here to the Philippian church. Number one, you notice in verse number 13, he said, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. Glory to God. Lay aside 
Forget about the yesterdays. Oh, I thank God for those high spots of spiritual victory that wherein God has moved and manifested Himself by His great power. And I gain strength from looking upon those. But dear friend, when I think about the future and the race that we're running and the goal that is set before us, I've got to focus my attention on something other than what is behind me. To the individual that is constantly looking in his rearview mirror, a wreck is inevitable and is going to happen real soon. The same thing is true from a spiritual standpoint. We can look at the past continually and we will find ourselves winding up in a bad wreck. You might look at the successes of the yesterdays and I don't know if any of us have any right to stand and say, look at what I have done. This being our 20th anniversary, I was reminiscing and thinking about the many things that transpired in the early days of this church. And I can see time and again where God gave the victory. Glory to God. I look at this physical building here and I recall the many, many hours that skilled men of this congregation dedicated their time and their energy toward building this church. Glory to God. Brother Passmore was the one that took the leadership in installing all this paneling around here. Brother Ingram did all the paint work around here. Brother Brian did all the plumbing and the air conditioning work. And I could go on and on and on with the many men who worked so faithfully and dedicated toward building this facility and to the credit of these wonderful men who gave of their time. And it wasn't just two or three but it was dozens of them they gave of their time and we were able to put up this building as you see it today for a little less than eleven dollars a foot now my friend that is quite an accomplishment even 20 years ago so we might look upon that and say that was a success but dear friends i want you to hear me clear this morning if we look at only at what we have done, it's not going to be long and we're going to run the risk of being destroyed by pride. Amen? Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a great fall. I thank God for these men. And when I think about what was accomplished, I want to stand on tiptoes and say praise God for dedicated men who are willing to give of their time. So he said forget to those things which are back there. We can also say, well, let's focus uh, upon the failures. Uh, dear friend, if there were failures of the past, uh, there is only one that was responsible for those failures. Uh, and you're looking at him this morning. Uh, and on my shoulders rests the responsibility of a lot of things that uh, should never occur. Uh, and I know we've had some battles. Uh, there's been a few skirmishes uh, and there's been some disappointments along the way from that standpoint. Uh, but once again, I'm going to stand on tiptoes uh, and announce to you I'm not going to focus on those failures. Amen. They're in the past. Uh, forgetting about them. I like the word forgetting here. It comes from the original Greek word which actually means to lose out of your mind uh, by way of neglect. Amen? Just to lose it out of your mind. A number of years ago, I have a great uh, nephew, I guess it is, and, and he was just a young little squirt, old, just three or four years old, and, and his, one of his parents was telling him to just forget about something, and he said, just erase it out of your mind. Amen. Just erase it out of your mind. I have found that if I do not dwell upon, quote unquote, the failures of yesterday, those things don't continue to hound me so much. Amen. Glory to God. Just lose it from your mind by neglecting it. And you know as well as I, when you neglect something long enough... It's going to vanish. Amen. You start dwelling upon it, it's going to get bigger. Glory to God. 
Now, I'm not saying that those things did not occur. They were very, very real. And brother, when you're in the midst of the battle and you can hear the bombshells bursting all around you, it's real. I'm not casting any reflection on the things of the past. But the writer says, forget those things. Forget them. But then he tells us to do something else. Reaching forth. Reaching forth unto those things which are before us. Glory to God. And I like this word reaching. <clears throat> this word reaching here actually means to stretch yourself. To stretch yourself. Glory to God. I never was very good at running unless a bull got after me. I got in school and I was going to run in the relays and I didn't come out very good running. I mean, there were a bunch of rabbits in that school. Those guys could run. And I didn't do very well, but I observed that those who were coming out ahead, they were just virtually stretching themselves all that they could to be the first one across the finish line. Dear friend, you and I are in a race today and we are nearing the shore. The lights of the harbor are shining brightly and from a spiritual standpoint, we need to tighten our belt, so to speak, and stretch just as forward as we can because we want to successfully finish and cross of that finish line. Glory to God, reaching forth unto those things which are before. What is ahead of us? Let me tell you that heaven is ahead of us. Amen. And we have not yet arrived. Amen. And stretch yourself that you may be accounted worthy to escape all the things that's coming upon this world. It is not the person that just has a little milk toast experience that is going to finish the journey. It is not the person who has just signed their name on a roster roll that is going to hear the Lord say, well done. But I believe it's going to be that individual who is fighting the good fight of faith. They've laid hold on to eternal life and they refuse to let it go. Amen. The devil doesn't want you to make it. But reaching forth to that which is before us. Glory to God. Heaven is before us. Again, I say, these things which are before us are very, very real. They are not imaginary. It's a real place where the Lord is and the place that the Lord has prepared for us. Wherever it might be, it is a very real place. And the Lord, thank God, is going to receive unto himself all of those who are reaching forth, stretching themselves, going beyond themselves, so to speak. We intend to make it. Thank God it is a very real place. Yes, heaven is where the Lord is. Heaven is a place where there's no more sorrow, pain, and heartache. Heaven is a very wonderful place. We haven't arrived as yet, but we're on our way. We're on our way. And let's don't let anything happen that will stop us. In closing, I want to read a poem. Now, I have read this poem many, many times at funeral services. And I sure don't feel like this is a funeral service. But it brings out the point. I am now in heaven. I am now in heaven. The gates have opened wide. And now I have the privilege of walking by his side. The angel choir is singing and the music is so sweet. I'll join them just as soon as I have worshipped at his feet. I am now in heaven, and the blood-washed throng is here. I recognize a lot of them. There's not a single tear. There's joy beyond description, and reunions by the score. There'll be no separations, for we'll be here forevermore. I am now in heaven. Please wipe away your tears. I've fought the battle, run the race. I'm rid of all my fears. There is no pain or sorrow here. The heartaches now are past. I've read and sung of heaven, 
and now I'm here at last. And I am now in heaven, and all the place is grand. No one could ever tell me all the beauties of this land. Since I cannot describe it, you'll have to come and see that it was worth the trials to live here eternally. Amen. Friends, we're on our way. We haven't yet arrived. And my admonition to the membership of Faith Tabernacle Assembly of God visitors and everyone in this congregation this morning, let's do two things that I've mentioned that the Apostle Paul tells us to do. Forget about the past. Forget about it. Every one of us have faced enough trials to choke to death a half a dozen mules. Amen? Forget about them. Let's reach out to that which is ahead. What's ahead for us? Heaven. Heaven. Where the Lord is. As this poem says, it was worth the trials to live here eternally. Would you stand with me, please? Glory to God, glory to God. Thank God, thank God, thank God. And Lord Jesus, and I love you this morning. And Lord, it is my prayer that not one single soul would miss heaven. Lord, I pray for Faith Tabernacle, Assembly of God. And for every person in this congregation this morning. Lord, I don't want to see a single one of them miss heaven. But Lord, we've got to press toward the mark. We can't just accept anything. We've got to make sure that we're on the right road. Lord, I do pray that you would help us to walk worthy, to be obedient to the heavenly vision, do those things that are pleasing in your sight that we might gain heaven. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. While the ladies continue playing this same beautiful number they're playing now, every head is bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this congregation this morning and you're not for sure that you're on the right road, would you please be courageous enough to walk down the aisle and kneel here at this altar. If there's a question at all in your mind, again, I'm not doubting anyone's testimony because before the Lord you stand or you fall. But if there's a question in your heart this morning as to whether or not you're ready for heaven, I invite you to come and pray. Let's talk to the Lord a while in prayer. Thank God Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to help you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Till we see Christ. Amen.